test. All right, everybody. Welcome uh, to the colloquium on sustainability marketing. And uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, this is a fantastic crowd we've got. Uh, welcome to everyone online as well who's watching from different corners of the US and uh, around the globe. Everybody here in the room is looking for the cameras. They're, they're high above your head in the new building of the School of Management. Um, my name is Stuart DeCue. I'm the program director at the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, which is a joint initiative between the School of Management and the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Uh, this series is sponsored um, or brought to you by the Yale Center for Business and the Environment and the Yale Center for Customer Insights. Uh, who, where are we? Can people raise their hands? I'm missing Heather. Yeah. Great. So um, this is really kind of a, a wonderful collaboration for us to, to work between two centers uh, that are both working at the School of Management and across campus on a topic that, that really engages um, a bunch of different professional schools and gets people uh, you know, quite excited. So we've really enjoyed the partnership. Uh, we've had a fantastic sponsor for this series, uh, DECRA. Uh, Anastasia O'Rourke, who's in the audience right there, is actually uh, sort of the lead consultant uh, who's working on building out DECRA's sustainability practice uh, in the US. And she's uh, an FES grad, uh, got her PhD from the school, and is local. So if anybody needs a resource that's on sustainability and knows a ton about this and is working in the field, Anastasia's right here to, to talk to you after the, after the talk as well. Also like to thank our media partner for this. Uh, so if anybody follows sustainable brands, you'll see that they send announcements about these talks, summaries about them uh, to a wider group of people. Um, so thanks to sustainable brands uh, for helping us distribute these talks. Uh, the title of today's talk is Fat Tire Slim Put Front Slim Footprint, Crafting Sustainable Beers and Brands. Uh, it's a discussion of sustainability motivations, initiatives, and messaging in the craft brew industry. Now, um, I've, I've been around here for about six years, and I was a student at the School of Management and the School of Forestry, and um, now I've been in an administrative role for three years, and we've hosted a lot of talks during that period of time. And so I sit, when we sent this notice out, I got more responses to this um, from alumni or other people that I've connected to than anyone else, any other talk that we've had saying, you know, you finally put your stamp on the program or something along those lines. Or I never cared about sustainability before until you finally sent me this. You finally figured out a way to make me like engage or get excited about this topic. So, you know, when we talk about this series and how you can inspire people to think about this through the brands that they love, I think that, that really hits on that message, that there's a universality uh, to this topic and to the product that we're going to discuss, or the product type that we're going to discuss that really gets people uh, excited. And personally, I can still remember as a college student the first time I had fat tire beer and how it opened my eyes to a whole new world of non-Miller Lite that had <laughs> changed my palate. So uh, it was really uh, an incredible experience. So I'm excited to hear this talk. Um, uh, the last people that I'd like to thank for this really um, the people in the audience and people online, uh, students have really generated, led, and pushed this as a focus for the School of Management and the School of Forestry. They've done a fantastic job with it. Uh, the two student leaders of it that have led this from the beginning, um, Marissa and Laura, have done an incredible job. Another um, student leader, Rachel, has also been a huge resource. I'm going to invite Marissa uh, Galicia down here to introduce our speakers and introduce a little bit more about the talk. Hi everyone, I'm Marissa Galizia. I'm a joint degree student here at the School of Management and the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you everyone for being here today. Um, as Stuart mentioned, I'll just echo his um, excitement to have our speakers here today and for this um, very both fun and interesting topic of craft brewing. Um, Chris O'Brien is uh, the author of Fermenting Revolution, How to Drink Beer and Save the World. He chronicles the evolution of beer, focusing on how the renaissance of craft brewing and home brewing over the last two decades is making beer a more communal, healthful, and sustainable practice once again. Um, and it has been said that his book turns beer drinkers into beer activists by providing an action plan for how to drink beer and save the world. So. Hopefully, all of you will go out and be, be beer activists after this as well. Um, since 2009, Chris has served as the Director of Sustainability at American University. Previously, he directed the Responsible Purchasing Network at the Center for a New American Dream. Um, 
and earlier served as managing director of the Green Business Network and the Fair Trade Federation. He is treasurer of the Fair Trade Resource Network and co-owns the Seven Bridges Organic Brewing Supply Cooperative. Jen Vervier uh, started on the bottling line at New Belgium Brewing Company 20 years ago. She became New Belgium Brewing's first chief financial officer and later chief operating officer. As the director of sustainability and strategy, her responsibilities include the sustainability management system, corporate responsibility reporting, greenhouse gas accounting, natural resource management, legislative advocacy, and philanthropy. Quite a lot. Um, as director of strategy, Jen oversees New Belgium's strategic planning process, public-private partnerships, and property development. So to those of you online, please feel free to engage via chat um, or to tweet at us at Yale CBay. We will have an audience Q&A after the session, and we would love to take your questions that way then. And with that, I'll hand it over to Chris to kick the session off. Thank you both. Thanks very much, Stuart and Anastasia and Marissa. Um, by that introduction, it makes it sound like I have done a lot, but really I just drink a lot of beer. <laughs> so things like this are what I need to keep doing in order to justify that. Um, so, so thanks to everyone for organizing this. <clears throat> um, so um, I'd like to just learn a little bit about uh, what you all do at New Belgium. I've obviously um, drank, I've been drinking your beer for a long time. Um, had a similar experience to Scott. You know, the first time I drank it, um, it just kind of pulled me into the to the beer. Um, but I've always had an, an orientation toward sustainability, um, and so I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about how New Belgium Brewing sees sustainability as part of its corporate identity, if it does, um, and and what you know some of the evolution of of how the company sees sustainability. Sure. Um, yeah, so our co-founders started the company back in 91 at the very beginning of the craft beer um, revolution, as you call it. Um, and before they even started selling any beer, they went for a hike in Rocky Mountain National Park to determine what kind of company they wanted to create, what their core values would be. And they came up with four of them, one of which was to be environmental stewards. So for New Belgium, that's been baked into our identity from the very beginning. And now, 20-some years later, we have a purpose that all of our coworkers orient around, like why do we come to work every day? And the reason that we say that we do is to manifest our love and talent, so our passion and our excellence, by creating our customers' favorite brands, as well as by proving that business can be a force for good. So we are motivated by the challenge of how can we be commercially successful, financially successful, and still live according to our values. <clears throat> so you've worked for, for the company for 20 years. I'm curious, at what point was sustainability incorporated into a job position? I mean, it sounds like you were the first person in a position with sustainability in the title. And how, what was the thinking that led to that? And just tell us a little bit about you know, what, what's the day-to-day -day of being a sustainability director at one of the country's biggest craft breweries. Um, we actually had sustainability staff folks before I had my position. And interestingly, they, that job started out in the marketing department. Um, because it was around answering customer inquiries, giving tours, serving on nonprofit boards, things like that. And then it moved over into environmental health and safety, which is another place where you see sustainability live when you're talking about uh, waste reduction and net, you know, net zero goals. Um, and then so when we created the executive level position to start getting strategy around sustainability, we realized that everything we had done to that date would be, was because people were really passionate and very conscious. But to secure our legacy, we needed to create a sustainability management system and set strategic goals as important as our goals around our financials or how we show up in the marketplace. Um, so in my job, I'm, looking, I'm working with the natural resources management team on how to improve our efficiencies. Um, we have a very robust philanthropy program where we give a dollar for every barrel of beer that we sell to nonprofits. So for 2013, that'll be close to $800,000 that we give to nonprofits that are strategically aligned with our mission. Um, and then, uh, as Marissa mentioned, political advocacy. How can we move the needle in policy to enable sustainability to be more likely and you know, more, more um, feasible? So it sounds like, at least in terms of the positioning within the company, it moved from starting out being part of how you tell the story, moving towards environmental health and safety, which I think you know, on the surface of it makes sense, 
and is now something that really sounds like it's more woven into the strategy of the company as a whole. Exactly right, yep. And, um, and really the motivation for that would just be that so that to make sure that, one, that we're walking our talk and that we continue to be true to what we believe in. Because it, it, because it has to be intentional and it has to be woven out through, obviously, you know, through the supply chain, through the value chain, operations, and, and how we show up in the marketplace. <clears throat> and so in your role with both strategy and sustainability, how, how are those two part of the same? Or you know, how, why are they related? Um, I think that I've been able to bring my s sustainability perspective to some of the things that we do in strategy, um, like uh, you know, a strategic project is site selection. So we have, to build, we have to build another brewery because we're running out of capacity. So how do we choose the location for that that is the most least impactful or, or you know, uh, helps us achieve our sustainability goals? I know in, in the uh, run up to this event, um, the organizers were looking to get some fat tire or other beers from New Belgium to be available at the happy hour and they couldn't find any locally. So I think there will probably be a lot of people mm -hmm. celebrating once that new um, right. brewery is open. What, any target date? That can, so that can we're show? in um, 36 states, so it's not just Connecticut that we haven't, we haven't gotten to yet. But um, we are breaking ground on our brewery um, in May and we'll be selling beer out of it in 2016. Okay. And that, it's in North Asheville, Carolina? Asheville, North Carolina, uh -huh. on a brownfield site. Okay. Uh, right on the, in the River District. Uh-huh. Great. Uh, so is New Belgium, do you think New Belgium is unique, or is there something, in, does, does the craft beer industry, uh, you know, I know your owner has, has served on the Brewers Association board for a long time. Um, it, from that vantage point, do you see sustainability as something that the craft beer community or movement as a whole embraces, um, or is there something... Um, sustainable about craft beer as as a product or as a um, as an experience, or is it something that seems more unique to New Belgium? I think that um, craft brewers in general are very environmentally conscious; that it is a sustainably aware community, and we've been uh, thinking about why that might be in conversations that I had today with folks here at Yale. And I think that that craft brewers are the ultimate conscious consumers. So, I mean, they're beer geeks to start, obviously, and, 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 then, and they're so passionate about their, their, what they love that they think, I need, I'm going to make it myself, I can make it better, I care about my ingredients, therefore I know my suppliers and my supply chain, I care about doing the best, very best job possible in my operations, therefore I reduce waste and, and optimize the process. I care about my customers because they're my neighbors, and I care about my coworkers because they're my neighbors, and, and so it's very community. Uh, embedded, and I think being embedded in a local community is, um, you know, one of the a genesis for thinking about your environment and wanting to preserve it. Do you think those environmental and sort of DIY values are reflected in the customer base of craft beer? A lot of people drink craft beer, so, which is a good thing. So it's hard to generalize, um, but yeah, I think that probably people who choose to drink a craft beer over another beer are similarly conscious consumers. They care about what they put into their body and they make the, uh, they make the decision to choose something that's a little bit different or a little bit more interesting. It has, has more of a story to it than perhaps uh, just pulling something off the shelf. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that you think craft brewers are interested in being part of their community. Um, I'm curious if you think that, you know, to, to me, one of the things I love about beer as a beverage is that it seems inherently like a social beverage. It's something that typically brings people together. Um, anytime you have a free beer happy hour, it's going to bring a lot of people out. Um, but it really is something that I think lends itself towards being social. And I'm curious if you see that aspect of you know, community building as being something that you view in tandem with sustainability. Do you, do you put those two? Um, concepts, do you think of them together or are they kind of diff different ideas, not really related? Um, good leading question. <laughs> but, um, um, absolutely related, you know, at, at, certainly at New Belgium, that sustainability is a broader category that doesn't just mean environmental stewardship, but also is how we um, create our culture and how the, you know, the relationship that coworkers have to each other. So within sustainability for New Belgium is you know, that we're 100% employee owned, that we have a democratic workplace, um, and that we have benefits that people kind of bring their whole self to work. So because I think because we're a corporation, 
we think of sustainability in terms of it's human centric. So where if you're just an environmentalist, you can think about nature for nature's sake, but we have maybe more of an instrumental view of nature, like how do we preserve a quality of life worth living? Um, and, and that aligns very well with craft beer, right? For like, Craft beer is one of the things that makes life worth living, and so, um, <laughs> and so you know that, and I think it, it aligns well with like the joy of being alive. So that's kind of what we try and communicate. So preserving natural environments, being able to have clean water to make clean beer, like all these things are woven together into what makes um, what makes a good life. Mm -hmm. So you, you talked a little bit about making sure that some of, broadly speaking, sustainability values are part of the intent of the company. Uh, but you also talked er about how sustainability was originally part of the marketing department. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how, um, it, what has the experience been at New Belgium integrating sustainability into the message to, to customers? Right. Um, well, it's, it's certainly been an evolution, and I think it's still a matter of trial and error. And I have some images that, if, if that I'd like to share, that how it's evolved. Um, and you know, one of the things I think we've realized is there are some consumers of environmental data are probably like all of us in the room, or many of us in the room, like we want the facts and the figures and we want to drill down into the calculations. And But the majority of consumers of information about New Belgium are just people who like beer. Mm -hmm. you know. And so what is our role in communicating to them? How do we communicate awareness to them about who, what New Belgium does to try and make, you know, to bring about positive change in a way that relates to beer? Because mm -hmm. we've found out over time that that's probably a good thing to do. So this is an, an, um, an older commercial, probably like 10 years old. And you can see by the fact that you can probably hardly even read it, that it has a lot of information on it. And this was one of our first forays into quote unquote environmental marketing or environmental sustainability. And the top of it says, somewhere at the top it says, you know, that we're, that we're New Belgium and, we're, and we pollute. So that was sort of our way to avoid greenwashing, like to say right out, like we use natural resources. Full stop. And here's some of the things we're doing to offset that, that those impacts. And it's a lot of information. And I'm not sure if it drove anyone to buy our beer or to buy more beer. And ultimately, our advertising dollars have to do both. You know, because we have philanthropy, and that can do philanthropy things. But advertising also needs to drive consumption. Right. Um, so then we went through another phase of what we called advocacy, advocacy and advertising combined. And so we thought, so. <clears throat> um, you know, one of the things you don't want to do is talk, brag about yourself. It doesn't come off very well. Um, and so to avoid that, we had an advertising campaign that featured other people, um, which was really interesting. Probably didn't sell any more beer. And it, um, and it didn't really have any relevance. It didn't really tie back to relevance for beer. Mm -hmm. So the next phase on that was um, uh, for a few years, we had a summer beer called, beer called Skinny Dip. Um, excellent beer. Um, and we tied that campaign to water advocacy. And so these are actual things that happened. Um, you know, this is like removing, removing a dam, uh, protecting a shore break in Southern California. Like these were real campaigns that we contributed to and we would, used our advertising to raise awareness of these issues. And then this one, our last, last year we had the beer, we tied it to, um, do you notice the other ones say save the rivers and this says save the Colorado because we initiated a um, philanthropy campaign and a partnership with other brands like Patagonia and Teva and Cliff to bring consumer brands together, um, not just to give money to nonprofits who work in the Colorado River Basin, but as to use our strength as a consumer brand to let the 30 million people who depend on the Colorado River for drinking water know that they do. So, um, you know, I don't know how successful this was at selling beer, but it certainly was a fun campaign and and tied to our philanthropy. Um, for a long time, this is one of the challenges I'm sure that you guys talk about in class, but that people, when you market something, you want it to be simple, and sometimes that can be inaccurate. And so for a very long time, New Belgium said that we were wind-powered because we subscribed to wind power back in 1998. We All of our electricity, we subscribed to the city's wind power program. We made a 10-year commitment to pay the extra money for that for that wind energy, which enabled our city to build another turbine and have a grid-tied turbine. So that was a real thing that happened. But over time, the city's uh, green energy portfolio also contained wrecks. And when we said that we were wind-powered, I think folks expected to drive up to the brewery and see the wind turbines. And so we just felt like it was too, that was um, 
could be seen as misleading to say that we were wind powered. And so we abandoned that tagline and picked up alternatively empowered, which is broad and also brings in the cultural piece mm -hmm. to our coworkers. So this campaign was about that. Again, probably too much detail for the average beer consumer. So this is a um, post coaster that we have out now, which I kind of like. And so <laughs> these are, um, these are our, this is an actual picture at the brewery and these are uh, methane storage balloons. Uh, we capture the methane from on-site water treatment, store it in these balloons and then pump it back, pipe it back to the brewery to run in two cogens to offset our peak power. It, it sounds like you're saying <clears throat> telling people about sustainability doesn't necessarily sell beer. I guess I should ask other people if that's true or not, but I think that might be true. Do, I mean, do you think <laughs> that, I mean, it, it seems like it might be a, a, a simple lesson, really, that, I mean, th this picture, maybe it's uh, what you're saying is telling them with a very crowded list of accomplishments is one thing, but showing them in one image tells the story for you without needing to cram in a lot of complicated right. s stats. Exactly. Is it, is it elegant? Is it engaging? And is it succinct? And, and do you think that this reflects the values of, of your customers to the degree that it would drive sales? Well, you know, I think it's tongue in cheek, which I think appeals to a beer drinking aged consumer. Uh huh. <laughs> um, yeah. Speaking of which, the, the, <laughs> the beer drinking aged consumer um, in your demographic is pretty tightly overlapped with the millennials um, who have some unique challenges as a, as a group because they don't really like to be marketed to. Um, they, they can tell when they're being told a, a story that sounds phony. Um, they want something authentic. So have you faced challenges uh, related to the sustainability message with millennials not really wanting to hear? You know, you mentioned greenwashing and trying to avoid it. Right. Have you ever felt like, well, you know, I guess the energy example was was an example where maybe would you have call, in retrospect would you call that greenwashing? No, I think I have to believe there's some intentionality to greenwashing, which mm -hmm. there never was. You know, um, I think it was just maybe confusing. Uh -huh. But with messaging to the millennials, actually, I think it's a great opportunity for New Belgium because I think our brand is spot on for millennial messaging. From my understanding of it and the things that we found out. Um, you know, millennials are very interested in the backstory of their product. So like we were talking about conscious consumers, like who is the company that is making the thing that I buy? And we have a great story. We like to present ourselves, you know, through our branding, and I think that resonates. Um, millennials are very interested in experiences. They're not passive consumers of, of their media. They engage with their media, you know, obviously with social media. And uh, I think New Belgium is pretty adept at that communication and that our message plays well there. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was an interesting point about intention with greenwashing and, you know, to talk about marketing and sustainability, I think a, a question that often comes up is where's the line between what's greenwashing and what's maybe simplifying a complicated message. Right. And it seems to me like maybe that's a good, good rule of thumb that um, an intentional um, overstatement of accomplishment, does that yeah. seem, or, or a simplification, a simplification where the truth is lost? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, and that I think is what brings so much complexity to marketing around sustainability because they're not simple issues. Mm -hmm. You know, which is better, can it, uh, aluminum can or glass bottle? Well, it's just I can't answer that in one word. You know, right. it's a complex issue with life cycle assessments behind it. But you know, right. So the challenge is distilling yeah. that into something that matters to your customer right. without losing the truth. So maybe do is. Are, does your marketing serve as, as an entry point into deeper information? Is there a lot more of this available if I wanted to drill down and learn Absolutely. about the, the real right. nitty gritty? Right, which I think a lot of brands are doing. So if you want, so are, we want to intrigue you, and if you are intrigued, then you can go to the website to find out more. You know, I think that's, that's the design of it. And then you can, you can look at the front page and see the very simple bit, and you can drill further and further and see the sustainability management system or the life cycle assessment or... I think that's the way to communicate with folks, but that's not, you've left the realm of marketing and branding, right, at that point, point. Right. and you're, now you're in a research project. And I'm cheating a little bit because I knew some of that answer because <laughs> I actually teach a class at our business school at American University on sustainable products, and we just read your LCA. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't read it and you're interested in LCAs, life cycle assessments, um, the first one I ever read, you know, talk about how do you bring people to, to an issue? Well, you talk to them about something they care about. 
apparently a lot of people care about beer when you come to a college. Um, so the first, I, I care a lot about beer and I care a lot about sustainability. So when you guys did a life cycle assessment of one of my favorite beers, I thought, okay, well, I can get into the details now because I care about the product. Was it more, as you read it, you were more interested because well, you're I could in relate. Barley, you're interested in hops. You're I, interested I, in I knew the packaging. ingredients. I knew the packaging. Right. So all, all of the decisions or the challenges that you were facing as a result of understanding the impacts of that product were things that I could relate to as a customer, right. because I could then see, oh, um, so where does New Belgium's responsibility end and someone else's begin when you're talking about open refrigerated units in corner shops where you're air conditioning a whole store, but your product is the cause of the air conditioning, but also my purchasing of your product. You know, who, who's... And if it wasn't New Belgium's beer there, certainly would be someone else's beer there. Right, right. Yeah. right. Mm -hmm. so, so speaking of small corner shops, um, you know, the craft, craft breweries have been metaphorically the small corner shop in the beer industry in, in North America for 30 or so years now. Um, edging up towards maybe now 7% or so by volume, does that sound right, that of, sounds right. Oh, of beer sales? Beer sold. Mm -hmm. uh, so still, relatively speaking, a drop in the bucket of the overall industry, and yet um, that's from almost zero 30 years ago to 7% now. So I, I'm curious how New Belgium, especially with opening a new brewery soon, sees that issue of scale and how that relates to sustainability and, and the story of sustainability, mm -hmm. uh, how big is is too big or is there such a thing um, at, at what point might your story have to change if you become you know mm -hmm. what are your sites for how big you want to grow and how does that affect your marketing of sustainability yeah and that's a great question and and it was one that occupied new belgium it occupied us internally for quite some time to grow or not to grow is it sustainable to grow and certainly we had folks inside on both sides of the issue um, and obviously we made the decision to grow, as, as you can see. And, and the reason that we came to that, for a couple of reasons. One, as I alluded to, people are going to buy beer anyway. And so if more people are able to buy our beer and we're you know, investing in um, sustainability and in a great place to work, you know, like if they're, that's putting people's money to good use. Like we know if they buy our beer, then they're investing in a more sustainable company. So that's good for one. And then for two, um, we are able to provide more employment that's um, you know, more meaningful for people. So the more people that we employ, the more people have meaningful work. Um, and then thirdly, we saw it as a chance to provide opportunity for people internally, which is a huge, you know, if, we are a, if you're a 30 person brewery and that's as big as you're ever going to get, then eventually your best and your brightest are going to leave and go to other careers and other places to, to stretch their wings and find their talents. But if we can keep growing, we can keep those people inside and develop, keep developing. You know, our turnover rate is extremely low. And I think one of the reasons is because we grow, we can continue to provide opportunity. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, so what you're doing now is, as a company, is good, and more of that is better. I think so. What, it, what about, so last time I checked, I think the, the numbers were something like one out of every two beers in America was brewed by AB InBev, what, what most people would think of as Budweiser, um, which is actually now the, at least last time I checked, and this may have changed, was the largest global brewing conglomerate um, owned by a Brazilian, new, a Brazilian Belgian um, conglomerate, no longer an American owned company. But in, in any case, to the scale question, is one in two too, too big? <laughs> you know, or could you see, uh, you know, is there a point at which scale might compromise some core value? I don't think it has to. Um, one and two is a bit of a thought experiment. You know, uh, that, uh. But um, uh, you know, one of the things that we've charged ourselves with, part of the challenge for us, is to prove that you can grow and stay true to your beliefs. I mean, that's the interesting, that's the interesting nugget there. So can we have two breweries and still have the same culture, or you know, as good of a culture in both? Can we be, um, ha have the pressures that larger companies have and still stay true to our beliefs. And, and going to 100% employee ownership um, at the end of 2012, I think for us was a, a huge hurdle in enabling that um, to secure our legacy. Because succession planning is real, you know, like the turnover of capital has to happen. And so one of the options, an obvious option was to be bought by another brewery. That's what Anheuser-Busch did, you know, that's what many craft brewers are, are having to do. And if we had 
gone down that route, then we would have lost control of our destiny. Mm -hmm. But by getting the financial deal put together that we could sell to our coworkers, we have ensured that we will be able to stay true to who we are mm -hmm. in perpetuity, hopefully. One thinks of other brands, mission-oriented brands like Ben & Jerry's uh, or Honest Tea, which um, I had the occasion to um, speak with Seth Goldman, the founder of Honest Tea just recently, who s sold Honest Tea to, to Coca-Cola 100%. Mm -hmm. It was a gradual sale that resulted eventually in 100%. Um, an another example is Cliff Bar. If people know, you know the, the um, energy bars. Um, the guy who started that company uh, tells a story where they were getting ready to, he, he was being wined and dined by big companies who wanted to buy He doesn't have to walk them. into the boardroom and sign the papers, That's right? it, right. And he, the way he tells the story, it moves a whole room. He, he, the way he tells it is he had literally golden pen in hand in a skyscraper in, somewhere in downtown New York City, about ready to sign a contract to sell his company. And he said he felt like he was about to have a heart attack. He went, out, went outside to get some fresh air and he never went back. <laughs> and as far as I can tell, um, they're still independent today. That's true. Yep. So it's obviously a you know a, it's a discussion that people with you know, a, a mission um, face that challenge, and it, it seems to me like putting ownership in house may be the solution. Yeah. Because then you'll you, you're not, as you grow, the decisions continue to be made by by the owners of the business right, exactly. or the, the mm -hmm. employees in your case. Yeah. Um, you, you've uh, done some cool, speaking of mission-oriented businesses, you've done a, a, at least one cool partnership that, that I know of um, with Patagonia. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so folks at Patagonia have been friends with us for a long time. We are aligned you know, on a mission basis. They contributed to our Save the Colorado River campaign, and we worked with them on that. And so last year, they approached us for their... Um, 40th anniversary. To brew, they asked us if we would brew a beer for them for their 40th anniversary, which of course we were honored to do. And then as we weren't through development with it, um, we realized that we could align it with the launch of it with um, Black Friday. And you know, a couple of years ago, they did the, uh, Patagonia did the full scale ad in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times said, don't buy this jacket, which was a pretty great, pretty great campaign. And so this was the next you know, Thanksgiving, day after Thanksgiving later that um, they launched in their stores that, take, uh, that they're going to start selling used Patagonia gear, and they're going to start taking it back in certain stores. And so um, uh, last summer, they came out to the brewery and met with our brewers and talked about what kind of beer they wanted to drink and what kind of beer they wanted to make. So we made an organic lager. Um, and we had no intention of, of selling it, but we had extra. And so you know, we just made it um, available on a small scale. So was that mission alignment? something that was nice to have and it made it fun? Or if, um, if Exxon Mobil came and said, would you brew a celebration beer for us? Would, I mean, you know, really. Because after all, it's, it's an employee-owned company making good beers that are sustainable. So what, I'm curious, yeah. you know, does the marketing, is the marketing alignment just a nice thing or is it, it's would it be a deal breaker? Absolutely essential, yeah. I mean, you know, you have to protect your brand with your life, right? Because it is, it's your identity. So, so no, we would never partner with Exxon. I feel I can unilaterally say that we would never partner uh -huh. with Exxon Rebel. Uh -huh. um, but we are looking at, so Patagonia was our first non-brewery co beer collaboration. We've done collaborations with many other breweries across the U.S. Mm -hmm. in the spirit of, you know, collegiality and sharing, just having fun together in, in the brew house. So the, Patagonia was our first non-brewery collaboration, and, we're, and it was so successful, and it, um, people were so into it that we're looking at doing more of those and we're going to focus, hopefully, on doing it with other B Corps, other beneficial corporations mm -hmm. like Patagonia, like Ben & Jerry's, so other folks who have um, gone through the process of getting a, a benefit corp certification, you know, third party, third party independent verification of that they're hitting certain social, environmental, sustainability goals, that they've changed their corporate charter to say that they provide a public benefit. So, so this is, you know, you, 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 you've come back to this social element of you know kind of community within the craft beer community of uh, you know collaboration beers with other breweries I'm curious if um, you know, if that's is that another thing where it's part of who you are or it's just something that's nice in other words where where does the where where might you draw the line between friendly collaboration and competition so, for example uh, there's been you know for beer geeks like me, I follow the 
the, the kind of in-house chatter, uh, uh, and there's been a recent controversy between a um, relatively local brewer here, um, the Boston Beer Company, and a company out on the West Coast has been challenging some of the marketing tactics by that company as being focused on competing with other craft brewers. Well, why wouldn't you <laughs> right. compete? You know, right. you're, you're, you want to sell more of your beer, but so it it, it it implies that there's some unspoken agreement that it's us against them, it's craft brewers against industrial brewers. Is that true, or is there some kind of collegiality that you won't you wouldn't want to cross a line, or ultimately is it selling more of your beer? Right. Um, our experience and our belief has been that um, you know, in the on the production side, the operation side, brewers collaborate with brewers, people in the labs collaborate with people in the lab. Like that, they're, you know, they're scientists and they're engineers and they love what they do and they love to share it in that. And we um, encourage that and it's a great part about being in the craft brewing industry. But once you cross over to the sales and branding, then you're not collaborating anymore. Uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. then it is, you're right, it's competition. Uh -huh. it's, not, it's pretty traditional. And I don't think, and anything that would be untoward in any industry would be that way in the craft brewing industry, but certainly, selling a brand, and because I know what you're talking about, but selling a brand that's popular, and so that some other brewery also makes it that brand, that, that's competition, uh -huh. yeah, which I think is completely above board. And all's fair when it comes to competition. No, not all, but certainly that was. <laughs> do, do, do you think that, you're, that, that your customers would punish you if they saw you as um, not being one of the gang within the craft beer scene? I think that most, 99% of craft beer consumers don't have the, the geekiness about it that you probably do. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? I don't think that they're... They're just, they're, <laughs> they're just buying a good beer. I think they're not aware. Yeah, they're just buying a good beer. They go to the shelf and they say, what looks interesting to me? Uh -huh. Either what, what packaging do I like? What brewery have I heard of that I think is cool? What styles do I like? Uh -huh. you know, what did I try at the bar that was cool? Yeah. And, and you mean the... the 0.01% beer geeks like me don't set the <laughs> expectations for everyone else. We're not, we're not controlling the marketplace tastes. I always you're, thought that was the case. You are an influencer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, well, so the, the, the million dollar question I suspect, at least for some people here, and then we'll open it up to questions, is um, you know, the first time that, that I met you was at the Craft Brewers Conference in San Diego. And it was very trying circumstances because there were 100 craft beer taps of Southern California beers mm. at this conference. And this was after a day yeah. of waking up tasting beers as part of the conference. At the end of the day at the hotel, the pool area was surrounded by 100 taps of California beer. Um, so how does someone get a job like this? <laughs> <laughs> Sustainability at a brewery. Do you just drink beer all the time and save the world, right? That's right. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> well, so let, let, let's open it up. Um, so I think we, uh, we have time for questions. And to ask a question, I'll try to keep a cue. Uh, but to ask a question, you have to press a button that's in front of you and hold it down, um, because we are streaming right now. Uh, so this is, your voice will be recorded. Um, and when you, before you ask your question, just say your name and, uh, what, and your affiliation. Questions? Hi, I'm Carol Rosenfeld. I'm a second year MBA student here at the School of Management. Thanks so much for your talk. And I wanted to go back to your point about, you know, is growth always good? Mm -hmm. um, I had the opportunity to see Seth Goldman speak about honesty in the fall. And he said sort of something similar to what you said, where he said, um, every time somebody chooses honest tea instead of soda, they're making a good sustainable decision. Mm -hmm. And similar to what you said about people are gonna drink beer anyway. And I think I came away with that a little bit cynical that people might be choosing to drink water. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with, is, is growth really always good? Yes, some people will always be drinking beer, but they could be drinking something else. They could be home brewing. <laughs> Well, I think that the consumer needs to choose that. I mean, like, like you as an individual citizen, I shouldn't just call you a consumer, you're also a citizen. And if you um, believe that water is the more sustainable choice, then you should make that decision. But as a brewer, I present my product. You know, do you know what I mean? And so, and so we present it to the marketplace, and the marketplace will decide. But I don't think that if New Belgium had stayed at half its current size, there'd be more people drinking water. That would be my, that's my belief. Other questions here and then there? 
Hi, my name is Devin. I'm from North Carolina, and I have a site-specific question for you, actually, about your new brewery in Asheville. Basically, how have you engaged with the local community there? What were some of the decisions, or what were some of the details surrounding your decision to locate there? Um, what are you going to, to do to increase uh, community involvement? Awesome. In um, so, well, we've done a lot around community participation in Asheville. I, I did site selection for the brewery, and then I worked for several months on uh, community relations. and. Um, so choosing the Asheville Brewery was, uh, obviously, so many things went into that decision around uh, the availability and quality of the water, the economics, you know, from land to labor to taxes to um, utilities, you know, the whole uh, shipping, you know, how it would impact New Belgium's uh, shipping costs. Um, and then the cultural piece was obviously huge for us. We were looking for a site where... Uh, our coworkers and our customers could bike to the brewery. We didn't want to be in an industrial park, you know, outside of the ring road. And, um, and we were also hoping to find a brownfield site because it was important to us as part of offsetting the impact of growth that we would rehabilitate a former manufacturing site rather than um, developing a green field. So we don't just grow, you know what I mean? We don't, we're not throw caution to the wind with growth. I mean, we're certainly very conscious in the choices that we make. So, so we were able to find all of those things in Asheville as well as a very sympathetic community as far as um, being progressive and interested in food and interested in beer and renewable energy and all the things that, that we care about as well. And so throughout the entire process, we've engaged with community leaders um, every, every, every other month or so, like all the... The key, uh, and there are a lot of neighborhood associations in Asheville, so the leaders from those bring them in, let them know of our plans, find out what their concerns are, work it into sort of an MOU around our development, um, and as well as in go, engage with the local brewers to find out what their concerns are with us coming and, and how we could mit mitigate that. So, that's your question. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Yesenia, and I'm a first year at the School of Forestry. Um, and first of all, I think you should collaborate with Yale and make a craft brew for us. <laughs> um, but my question has to do with... Ivy League series. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question has to do with um, your sourcing for your, um, your grain or malt mm -hmm. um, and or hops. And I'm wondering what sort of sustainability goals or metrics you have around the agricultural aspects of the brewing, mm -hmm. and if you have any, um, if there's any movement towards sourcing organically, or if that's part of your sustainability goals. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do recall you having a, an organic beer, mm -hmm, um, yep. and if you could tell us a little bit about how that experience went, and maybe sort of the future of the organics, if you're going to go that route. Okay. Um, so yeah, we did, at one for a few, quite a few years, have one organic brand, and um, and you know, with the organic certification and the cleaning in between and the, you know, they separate the raw materials, it, we quickly realized they either, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. It would be easier to have everything be organic than just one brand. And um, there were limits to the supply of organic barley we could get and the quality of the malt that we would need to produce our beers, as well as the cost. So there were a lot of things not in favor of that. And we looked at the, you know, several million dollars at that time, it was quite a few years ago, that would be incremental cost. We felt like we could do um, more impactful things with it than buy organic barley. Um, but in our supply chain, this is one of those scale things. We are not big enough to know who our farmers are. Like we buy our malt from maltsters who buy from barley growers. So we don't have that one-to-one -one relationship that a much, much bigger brewery would be able to have. But we do have sustainable purchasing guidelines that we engage with our major engage our major suppliers around. So we will, you know, score them on quality and price and customer service, as well as a whole section on sustainability that it's relevant to, you know, is it water use? Is it waste reduction? Is it that they participate in their with their industry groups to improve the sustainability of their industry practices? Um, so we we try, you know, we. We try to keep it a dialogue with our suppliers to learn about what their challenges are and to suggest ways that would be meaningful for us as their customer for them to change their practices. There, as a follow-up to that, I know there are there's at least one grower, small-scale hop grower in Colorado, right? It, and maybe even near Fort Collins. Have you been part of that? No, we did um, uh, finance, we did support a program at CSU to look at developing a hop industry in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So with the ag extension, like what varieties grow here, how do you take care of them, how do you help farmers convert their fields. 
But again, it's a ma then it's the matter of scale in the other direction. Right. Like the amount of hops that are pr grown outside of Fort Collins would not even be one batch of beer right. for New Belgium. You know, so so then we're then we're too big to take advantage of that kind of scale. But I'm sure that many local local like just sell right out of their brewery. Brewers could take advantage of it. Do, do you think that's in the cards sometime in the future? A more direct relationship with suppliers either of of malt from growers that you might be able to identify upstream at at the at the at the barley growing level, or on the on the other side on the hop level. On, yeah, on I think sources. in a collaborative way, like that we meet with a consortium of growers, and certainly at the hops, we we know who those growers are because there there are less of them that supply the industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's industry. That's interesting. Hop growing in America is changing because of craft brewing. I, mean, I don't know if you've looked in your you know research into the supply chain. It's craft brewers are making a a big mark on what that industry looks like in the Northwest. Uh -huh. In terms of because the varieties? Of or? Because of the high hop beers. Uh -huh. that, was, you know, that wasn't true for so long. There was a certain amount of hops and a certain variety of hops, and that was what went into um, you know, industrial lagers, and now the hop proliferation is intense. Right. OK, other questions? One, two, and then three. Hi, we have a few questions from the live stream. Uh, so the first one is from Sean, and his question is, uh, with breweries focusing more on sustainability, who tends to respond to the sustainability focus more? Is it older or younger aged drinkers? That is a great question. And I'm honestly, I'm not sure. Um, people who are at universities doing research projects, <laughs> <laughs> they're the ones I talk to the most. But um, uh, I would have to believe that from you know, our research that younger drinkers care more about what they're consuming. And so they're the ones who are most interested in the backstory behind their products, all, all across the board, not just beer. Uh, I'll just ask one more from the live stream. So our second question is from Eleanor, and she has directed her question to Jen. Jen, you mentioned engaging on policy to make sustainability initiatives easier. Why do you think it's important for companies to do that? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think that uh, policy, um, Regulation kind of sets the baseline for behavior and that certain things, you know, like uh, carbon trading is an obvious one. Carbon trading just doesn't happen voluntarily. Unless there's regulation to re reduce emissions, no one's going to take on the expense. And in the U.S., that's a, quite a bit of a distant um, imagination that, that that will happen. But, you know, more up close, we look at recycling. So the sustainability of our product is in part determined by the recycled content in our packaging. And New Belgium can't determine how much recycled content's in our packaging. That's an industry-wide thing. And so how do we increase the um, recycled content? By there being more recycled raw material, more recycled feedstock, as it were. And so when you look at states that have a bottle bill, and they have an 80 to 90% recovery rate, and you look at states that don't, and they could have a 0 to 10% recovery rate. So that feedstock is not available in states without a bottle bill. So that's just. I'm not saying that the bottle bill is the best answer, but it's an example of how regulation creates the conditions to improve sustainability in some cases. OK, there was a question over here. Um, thank you for coming this afternoon, evening. Um, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a first year student at the School of Management. And my question is largely about the conflict between pure, like fully sustainable breweries and more local breweries that maybe are not mm -hmm. scalable yet to really achieve the sustainability goals. And um, at what point you see like that being a large source of conflict with New Belgium, and when it um, grew so that it wasn't its own issue? Um, the conflict internally or conflict with other breweries? With other breweries. Well, we try not to engage in a conflict-based <laughs> competition that we talked about before. But I certainly think that um, the people wanting to purchase locally is obviously real, and there's and there's merit in it, and. New Belgium can't be local, but in you know two places eventually. However, that being said, I still think that the, the cons it warrants the consumer to consider buying a New Belgium beer over a local beer, just because of the things that you said, like because we're able to give money in their local community, because we employ people, you know, in sales and distribution and retail in their local community more than a very very small brewer can. So I don't think it's either or, but I think that there are things that a larger company that is focused on. Um, on making positive change can do that's maybe more impactful than a very small brewery could. I, I just want to follow up on one of the one of the things you mentioned a minute ago um, regarding 
you know, the availability of recycled content material has to do with whether there's a bottle bill in the state or not. So I'm curious if, um, if New Belgium has, uh, has or would lend its voice to policy advocacy that outside of policies that might you know, be obvious things that would ease the, um, that would improve the market for selling craft beer, but things that have more to do with sustainability. Um, on a, with a sidebar there being to note that the, I don't know if it's former or if he still is the governor of Colorado, owns a brew pub in downtown Denver, right? He, and he's me still the governor. He had to sell his interest in the brew pub okay. when he got into politics, but yes. Okay. Has, so politics. He is a brewer. He is the governor. We have a brewer. In Colorado. Exactly. Yeah. But, but have you done advocacy or would Absolutely. You? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm very, I'm passionate about advocacy. Um, so uh, around climate, we're members of um, business, Businesses for Innovative Climate and Energy Policy, which is a part of Ceres. Um, around water, I mean, so we're trying to pick the issues that are aligned. So not like you're saying, not like access to market, really alcohol beverage related, but that are still aligned with our in business interests. Um, we've been very active to um, strengthen and clarify the uh, jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act and pushing the administration and the EPA to strengthen and, uh, and kind of uh, reverse uh, Supreme Court decisions that weaken the Clean Water Act. Um, is there fracking in Colorado? <clears throat> there is fracking in Colorado. There's a lot of oil and gas development in Colorado. Is, is water contamination an issue that, that you've gotten involved in related to fracking? Our position on fracking is um, somewhat nuanced by virtue that we depend on natural gas to make beer. And you know, you have to heat, you have to make steam, right, mm -hmm. to make beer. And so I feel like it would be disingenuous for us to be against uh, gas development unequivocally because we depend on natural mm -hmm. gas. And we also know that uh, making electricity with natural gas seems to be, although the data is somewhat squishy in different areas, but it seems to be um, have, has less of a uh, climate impact than making it out of coal. So, you know, gas has that advantage. Um, what I believe and what New Belgium, um, the position that we take is that, that fracking is going, is here to stay. So how can we regulate it to make it as safe as possible? Mm -hmm. To make it the least impact on water, the least impact on local communities, uh, the least impact on landowners. And so I think that Colorado leads the nation in um, you know, progressive or str strong regulation around fracking. Another one of those complex sustainability issues that is hard to distill into a single know, image right? in an advertisement. Yeah, exactly. Was there another question I thought of? Yeah. Hi, I'm Corey from the Forestry School. I just want to go back to packaging real quick. Um, I know a lot of brewers prefer to package their beers in cans uh, because, um, because of claims that it preserves the beer better, but also that it uses less resources in terms of um, reducing weight and transportation. I was wondering if New Belgium has done any LCAs in that regard to uh, guide the way that it packages its beers. Yeah, absolutely. We did do an LCA around uh, can, can versus bottle in shorthand. Um, and the reason we did it is because we were seeing a lot of claims by other craft brewers that it was a, cans were a more sustainable package. And then we had people asking us, because we have done LCAs before and we've been out in front on these issues, what was true and we didn't know, so we felt like we had to do the LCA. And it's very, um, for those of you who have ever done an LCA, the, the reliability of the data that you're getting is questionable. You can use the very best databases, but you don't have transparency into where they're getting their data. So I would never take an LCA to the bank. Um, <laughs> It's directional, I think, and it has orders of magnitude impact. And so when you're looking at cans compared to bottles, um, obviously bauxite mining is hugely impactful and creates a high hurdle for the can to overcome throughout the rest of its life cycle, which it is able to do so because of transportation, as you said, the lighter weight and shipping. Um, and then we found out another, um, another thing that advantages the can, but is certainly just a... Um, a coincidence, as it were, or not, not a coincidence, but it's not intrinsic to the can, is the fact that aluminum smelters have sited on hydro, on, uh, get, get their electricity provided by hydroelectric, which makes their electricity impact much less than someone who is getting it off a coal-fired grid. So bottom line, there are not real, there are not massive advantages from a, at least from a CO2 emission standpoint for either package. And I think the consumer should choose which one is appropriate to their drinking occasion. And they're both, they both have their place. 
bottle or can, both. <laughs> and don't forget the keg. And the keg, right. I probably one of Which the, is the most sustainable. Right. Of course, at draft. Um, other questions? Yeah. When you think about the kind of five to ten seconds you have when a consumer is scanning the aisle and looking at a bottle, is there any relevant eco-label or signal that you can send or you think or you guys are going to think about testing that mm -hmm. could signal that sort of sustainability and, and you think there's actually a reasonable sized percentage of the market that's going to respond to that? You know, Is there a group of consumers who actually care enough to see something and is there something you can put on there which will drive sales uh, in a way that's focused on sustainability? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You, I wish you would tell me what that <laughs> label would be. Um, you know, I think that organ that there are certainly consumers who are more aware of what organic means and probably look for that, although it's not that available, you know, widely available in beer. Um, you know, we have a 1% for the planet um, logo, but I think it's on the bottom of our six-pack carrier. We have a B Corp logo, but I think it's on the bottom of our six-pack carrier. So our position has been not to clutter the aesthetic with certification logos. Um, so I guess the short answer is, yeah, for us, there has not been a, a silver bullet for this means we're A-OK. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting because there's just a proliferation of those logos. And I'm sure, I'm sure New Belgium is involved in so many sustainability-related efforts that have logos Absolutely that you right. could probably have a can covered with every logo except your own. Right. That's true. That's <laughs> and and true. sometimes you see products like that. Mm -hmm. Um, other, I think we have time for one or two more. Hi, I'm Kenny. I'm from the uh, forestry school. Uh, talking about B Corp and sort of the idea of certification, it seems to be that B Corp is starting to grow as more of a legis legislative and regulatory way of doing business and less so as just a like cold cut, throw a label on your bottle. Yeah. Uh, Entity and what do you, how do you see New Belgium as like building that community of B Corps and growing? Because you mentioned craft brewers as sort of the ultimate conscious consumer and opening that door to getting other breweries into B beneficial certification and how that can help grow B Corp as a sort of way of doing business. Yeah, that's a great question. And when we first started talking to the B Lab folks a few years ago, and they were saying, "This is our this is how we imagine it." and your consumer will know you're not greenwashing, and you'll have a community of people where you can share services at a reduced cost, and there's this legislative piece. And we kept bringing, like, that's the piece that's inter interesting. That's what's new and unique, that, um, that be the beneficial designation is unlike any other logo or certification that you could get. Um, so, and, yeah, so that's why it's interesting to us, and that's why I think that it has real gravitas around it, because you're actually changing your corporate bylaws to say that you're going to be different. And we are in Colorado. The, um, B-Lab has opened up an office to make Colorado some, one of the epicenters of the movement, and, and certainly New Belgium would be very interested in reaching out to other craft brewers who are interested, because I think, like you say, they're already, they're already almost there. Jen, Jen, you mentioned changing the bylaws, and for people who might not be familiar with Benefit Corp as a as a tax in a corporation status, what's the key? How is it different from other types of incorporation? So, if you you have to be in a state where it's been passed that there exists this entity called Benefit, you know, Benefit Corp. So there's you're still an S corp or a C corp. It doesn't change your tax status in that way. It just says that for you to call yourself a benefit corporation that you have to put in your corporate charter that you work towards a specific public benefit. So not just for the benefit of your um, shareholders, but other stakeholders. And what it provides, it provides actually fiduciary cover for your board and for your managers to make decisions that aren't always preferential towards um, maximizing shareholder value. Mm -hmm. So it's moving, it's actually moving from the American model of shareholder capitalism to a stakeholder model. Mm -hmm. I think it's super exciting. Yeah, potentially really groundbreaking. I know we have efforts in DC and in Maryland. To change. To, yeah, to, mm -hmm. to create the legal status. In yeah, and in Delaware, it, it passed in Delaware last year, and Delaware is sort of the, you know, the center of corporate law for the United States. So, mm -hmm. so do we have, um, flag me if we're going to run over, or should we take one more from online? Or? Okay, anyone want the last word? <laughs> Or do you just want to get to the happy hour? <laughs> okay, happy hour it is. Well, thank you all so much for coming, and let's thank Jen and Chris for leading us through a really great discussion.